Coming up, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter goes into safe mode. Atlas V issues a money-back guarantee. R2 shows a little leg, and have we forgotten about the moon? The what? Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins now. And welcome to Space Cast, episode 7.08 for Saturday, March 15th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham, and we'll be your hosts for this episode today. Before we get started, we'd like to say a huge thank you to the Space Cast premier patrons who have helped make this show go. Now, the premier patrons, they're the ones who have spent $10 or more at patreon.com slash spacevidcast on this episode. So $10 or more, and you could become a Space Vidcast premier member. You not only get your name in the show, but there are a few other perks as well. You can get more information at patreon.com slash spacevidcast. And uh, it's members like that that help ensure that Space Vidcast continues to do this week after week. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great program. I think it's a lot better than the uh, previous program we had, which is epic. If you get value from Space Vidcast, please consider putting value back in. Now, you don't need to spend $10. You can spend less than that. Uh, there are different reward levels that you can go. So more information at patreon.com slash Space Vidcast. Let's go ahead and get some st started with some space news. First up, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has got went into safe mode and has since come back out. Yes. MRO went into safe mode on March 9th after an unscheduled computer swap. And then back on Thursday morning, March 13th, uh, the, we actually resumed normal science um, back on the main computer. But the, the antennas, so what has happened is the primary antennas have failed to the backup area. Right. And they've stayed on the backup antennas. Mm -hmm. But the primary computer's back in play again. Right. Now, we use MRO for a couple of different things on Mars. Uh, first off, it, it, its name it kind of self-descriptive, right? Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, so right. it orbits Mars. Uh, it does recon work for us, so it's mm -hmm. going gonna to take pictures of Mars. Uh, but more importantly, the two remaining rovers that we've got on Mars, we've got um, Curiosity yes. and Opportunity. Yes. I'm like, Spirit, no, no. <laughs> not Spirit. <laughs> so we've close. got Curiosity and Opportunity remaining on Mars. Well, they don't have antennas that are going to make it all the way back to Earth, so we right. use the satellites. We use Odyssey and MRO to be, we beam the signal from the the rovers up to those satellites, and then the satellites repeat it back over to Earth. So when MRO was offline, we've actually took some of that science down. No, we still had Odyssey, so we could still use Odyssey for all of that. Right. But it, uh, you know, wasn't really available for um, full science payloads because you can only do it when Odyssey's overhead. Right. If that makes sense. So we're back to full, Yay. back to full science, full speed for full science uh, on Mars uh, with both MRO and Odyssey mm -hmm. uh, for opportunity and curiosity and yay. And hopefully they'll figure out what's going on with the transmitter. Exactly. Yep. Atlas V money back guarantee. Ooh -hoo. All right. So you want to fly your commercial payload on an Atlas V rocket. Because who doesn't? Because who doesn't, right? It's an awesome rocket. It has a great track record. This is true. Ever since United Launch Alliance took it. Here's, here's a shot. This is what an Atlas V rocket looks like. Uh, it's a workhorse in the United Launch Alliance Army, right? They've used it many times, but generally not for commercial payloads. Mm -hmm. Usually it's for government payloads. And the reason it's used for government payloads, not for commercial payloads, is its price. It's really expensive. Really, really expensive. Uh, we're talking $225 million uh, to launch on an Atlas V, uh, which is just, it can be a lot, uh, particularly when, um, you know, the commercial, the commercial, uh, I was going to say launch providers, the commercial customers uh, in general don't have that kind of money just sort of laying around and you're going to put all of your money into just the launch itself and comparatively spacex falcon 9 launch is about 45 million dollars uh, 54 so, i'm sorry 54 so sorry i inverted my numbers so 225 million versus 54 million dollars is kind of a huge thing uh but with this money back guarantee sort of idea or uh yeah no money back guarantee right that's yeah. basically it uh should something happen to the payload on launch uh then you get the money that you paid into for the launch. You yep. don't get money back for the payload itself, but you get money back from 
buying the ride, essentially. So using even numbers, if the launch was an even 200 million mm -hmm. and your payload was an even 200 million, mm -hmm. then uh, you would get, and you were ascending and the Atlas V had a rapid unscheduled disassembly, you get one of two options. One, they're gonna give you 200 million back. Right. And then your insurance company will hopefully pay for your payload. Hopefully. Or two, they if you have a second payload, which mm -hmm. sometimes you do, usually that's for the government, but Maybe you do. Maybe yeah. you've got another one laying around. Maybe it was a fleet and you've got the next one ready to go. Sure. Then uh, you could opt to fly that payload again on an Atlas V for free. Mm -hmm. So your only cost was that new payload. Yeah. Which is, you know, I guess that's good. I think they're trying to be more competitive because if you fly on a Falcon 9, you do have to pay insurance for the Falcon 9 right? for right. the whole reloft of the flight, I believe. I don't know that for certain. So if I'm a consumer... I'm a consumer. If I'm a consumer and I can afford a rocket launch, good for me. Yeah, if no if I'm a customer and I'm putting a payload into orbit, I'm definitely paying for my payload and I'm definitely paying for insurance on the payload, but right. I think I'm also paying for insurance to refly the payload okay. to make up the money that would have been lost by. Right, right, right. right? right. So I think that's what United Launch Alliance is kind of trying to circumvent or get around saying, look, that's built into the cost of this rocket. Right. But by the numbers, you could have four Falcon 9 rockets for the price of one. Yeah. Actually, you could have five. You could have five, almost, not quite. You not could have four, five. like four, four, four and a quarter. Four and a, yeah. Four and a quarter. <laughs> Yay. So, I only want a quarter of a rocket launch, please. <laughs> Thank maybe you. Maybe someone does, secondary payload, something yeah, like that. I suppose. That. that would work. So this is a slightly more geeky thing. Uh, you guys all remember the Ares 1. Uh, this was uh, part of the Constellation program, and it was a solid motor stack. So mm -hmm. instead of using liquid, like we do for most everything else, it used a solid kind of a, almost like a rubber fuel, okay. uh, and it did so in a five-segment stack. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this, in, with solid fuels, any solid fuel, is that there's something called thrust oscillation. And what that is, is basically it vibrates. And it vibrates a lot. It, it shakes you a lot. And you, you hear stories of the space mm -hmm. shuttle where uh, when they're when they're ascending, and it, the solids kick in the astronauts like, oh boy, wow, you know, it's a much more violent ride going right. up. And you can actually see it. If you ever see internal footage of the space shuttle, you can see them just shaking as they go up. And then the solids detach. And while they're still getting speed from these main engines of the space shuttle, those are liquid, right. and it becomes a much smoother ride. Okay. So that vibration is coming from the solids. Now, mm -hmm. on the space shuttle, the whole vehicle absorbed that vibration. So right. you didn't, you weren't being sh shook to death. Right. But on an Ares 1, you're sitting right on top of it. Right, there's right? nothing else it's, there. It's the solid motor, and then you sit on top of the solid motor, and there was concern that it will vibrate you to death. Now, those concerns were apparently from an overly, uh, what am I trying to say, optimistic, uh, in over, they were being overly paranoid okay. with the numbers, and it turns out that that was not actually the case uh, with the Ares 1. You would have been able to survive just fine, yeah. based, based on additional data that we had since gathered. But, point is, uh, uh, ESA and, oh, I don't remember who else, but ESA in France, CNES, I think, I C think it's, yeah, yeah uh, are trying to figure out what this is how to dampen this. We kind of know what it's coming from. So they actually have a test article. Here it is. Uh, this is a solid motor uh, test article. This is a reduced scale of two to nine uh, solid motor. And this is based on the Arion 5 solid motors themselves. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of this is that we want to see, or they want to see, if they can actually figure out how to dampen some of this and get more data on what's happening inside of a solid motor. Hmm. So uh, here's actually a test firing. This lasted 28 seconds at a pressure of 65 bars, and uh, there were 263 sensors on it. Wow. And what they're trying to do is get modeling data for mastering the phenomenon of this uh, thrust oscillation on the solid motors. And the advantage of this is... Uh, so, so a lot of people are anti-solid fuel, right. and that's the wrong approach. It's all it's different technology that can be used in different ways. Right, so right, solids right. do have their place. So if if you can figure out what's causing this, and you can minimize it, you don't necessarily have to do, get rid of it, but if you can uh, help mitigate it mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't add a lot of weight, now you've got an extremely powerful engine, right. a motor, right. that can help bring you to space without a huge lot, a huge amount of oscillation going up. Right. And that's exactly what they're working on. So um, basically what happens is there are vortices that shed within the solid motors during combustion, uh, which creates the shearing effect. That's, that's what happens. Right. And so now they're trying to find a way around that.
Very nice. Yeah, absolutely. And that happened uh, Tuesday, March 11th, 2014. Yay. Uh, we're showing a little leg now. No, oh, well, so, I mean, who isn't these days, really? Right. I mean, SpaceX is showing some leg <laughs> of the Falcon 9 R, our Falcon 9 1.1 1 .1 oh. at uh, Cape for a uh, launch. Yep. And then Robonaut. They're actually bringing it right. Check it out. This is creepy in so many different ways. Would you say seven points? Uh, the? Yeah, there are seven joints. Uh, so what's going on is they're going to be putting legs onto Robonaut 2, who's on the International Space Station. I, I do also love that we sort of speak to about him as if he is a real thing. <laughs> um, well, he is a real thing. No, but you know what Just I'm so saying. Just so you know. That, uh, <laughs> no, I, you know what I'm saying. I We humanize this sort yeah. of, which is the whole well, idea. We made him look human, so that's, that's why we humanize him. We did. Uh, the full leg span is nine feet long uh, with seven different joints. And uh, you saw the sort of clamps in the video there at the end instead of feet. So uh, this will enable him to go around the station a little bit better, as well as eventually go outside of the station and do uh, some of those spacewalks that we we know are extremely dangerous for humans to be doing, uh, even if their spacesuits leak Creepy. water for no good reason. Man, imagine him walking on the outside of the space station, just kind of walking around that, and that kind is of the stuff peering that into of. the cupola and freaking out the astronauts. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's super um, creepy. The effectors that, that are on the bottom... The the feet little clampy things um, also have a very similar vision system that the cannon arm has oh. so it can see what it's clamping onto. that's cool yeah that's very very cool and the reason for the seven joints of course is to be able to maneuver around better uh, than a human would be able to and, and nine feet obviously much longer and there's just so many different options when that comes around. Um, but, yeah, we, we made the joke earlier about, like, Falcon's just full of legs these days anyway. Well, and we didn't mention, so the, the legs are going up on the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, so, yeah, the SpaceX uh, is The next, next CRS-3 mission, mission from SpaceX, mm -hmm. uh, which is slid to the, no earlier than March 30th, right. has these legs on board. Yes. So SpaceX is bringing Robonaut's legs up on the rocket that now has landing legs, legs attached to it. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, awesome. Uh, and I also sort of love that everyone keeps calling Robonaut 2 R2 for short, which means eventually we are going to have an R2-D2. Someday. Aware of We're that. working towards it. NASA is diligently working towards putting yeah. R2-D2 on the International Space Just Station. Just FYI. You know that that's a thing that's happening. <laughs> uh, really quickly, before we head into break, the uh, first test flight of Orion has been delayed until 2014. I'm sorry. December, December 2014. 2014. <laughs> it, we're in 2014. Uh, so what you're looking at right there, that's uh, that's some shots of uh, Stage 2 and Orion. The test flight will not not use the space launch system rather it will use a delta 4 heavy to launch and that's actually why it's been delayed um, it's supposed to launch in september or october however uh united launch alliance uh needed to kind of take that slot for a different military payload so they're just doing a basic shuffling of the delta 4 heavy parts of the delta 4 heavy have already arrived at the uh, processing location so they're pretty they're getting ready to put it all together but it will be december as opposed to september october how uh, the orion team mm -hmm. uh, said that they're going to push for a september october release date of orion anyhow oh. so the vehicle should be ready but um they just won't have a slot in the the launch man right. launch schedule to to bring it up into space. This oh, is a exploration. T what? Oh, what is it? Exploration flight test yes. number one. And yeah. the idea is, um, Orion goes up. It will orbit twice, I believe it is, mm -hmm. and then we're checking the computer system, avionics. We're testing the new uh, blade of heat shield, right. stuff like that, and just making sure that the vehicle does what we expect it to do, so that we're confident before we put humans on board. Mm -hmm. So that's ETF one Yay. exploration. Test Flight 1. Uh, before we go into break, Cosmos Hyper Nerdy. Oh, I should have grabbed that clip. I forgot oh, to grab that clip. Oh, we didn't grab the clip. Oh, man. You know, we should add that in the show notes. This is a great clip we of this should. little clip kid watching Cosmos and just freaking out. And that's how I felt. I the thought moon, it was really it's great. It's the moon. It's the moon. It's the moon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I cute. thought it was really great. And I'm excited to see something like this back on television totally. and people getting excited and, and you can watch cosmos i believe it airs sundays uh on fox sunday yes. nights on fox check your local listings it does air worldwide in something s stupid like a hundred plus countries and for those of you who don't have tv and only watch the internet it is all is also on hulu so no excuses for you it's also on youtube i found out recently wow yeah so they really are trying their best to get the word out to Air by air by. Yeah, not kidding around. So check that out. And uh, uh, of course, uh, once more, uh, Patreon, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more before when we come back in, uh, from the show. But that is what makes this show go. So much like Cosmos, uh, actually, someone commented last week saying that 
Um, they like Space Vidcast more than both series of Cosmos, the Carl Sagan version and the Neil deGrasse Tyson version. Aww. And while I am flattered, um, I, I think they have a slightly more production uh, budget for both of those shows. Tough, but we have but twice the hosts. We have twice the hosts. But imagine what we could do if we had uh, their budget. Ooh. Anyhow, uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, back our main topic, which is asking, are we forgetting about the moon? Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So when it comes to oh I did it again I just I get so excited about the topic so I forget, excited I forget to 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 talk about the really important thing that helps make Space Vidcast go so uh, patrons Space Vidcast patrons these are the Space Vidcast producers anyone who spent five dollars or more mm -hmm. on this episode is mm -hmm. a Space Vidcast producer mm -hmm. and you can become a Space Vidcast producer as well by going to patreon.com slash Space Vidcast and like, like I mentioned we're doing something a little bit different with these slates this week so I'll talk about that in the next segment mm -hmm. in the uh, your comment section uh, but really it does it goes even one dollar helps so much if, if you're willing to give one dollar per episode which is less than a cup of coffee or less than a latte I suppose it. How much, I don't. I have no idea how much a cup of coffee. It's is less it? than a cup of coffee most places. Okay, it's less than a cup of coffee. So one day per week, you give up one cup of coffee and say, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna fund this science slash space based channel. That goes a tremendously long way to helping us do cool new things. So again, we'll talk about that in the third segment a little bit more. The main topic for this show: Are we forgetting about the moon? The what? Exactly. The point <laughs> The point is, and this is something that I'm asking you as a collective group, and, and the chat room, the live chat room that we've got going on right now, I'm, are we forgetting about the moon? We're so focused on Mars right now. SpaceX mm -hmm. has said, look, we're going to Mars. I, I think they view it as the moon possibly as a distraction, right? Mm -hmm. Why go to the moon? What are you learning on the moon? We need to go to Mars. That's where we spread our true spacefaring legs and become a multi-planetary species. Right. Right? So, not wrong. Right. But there's something magical about the moon that you just don't get with Mars. Yeah. Imagine for a moment you want to get more people excited about space and science. Mm -hmm. You're not going to send them to Mars. You want them to experience it. If you can get someone to experience it, more than just talk about it, right? Going to space as an experience. Even more than just the weightlessness. Just more. That's a great start, though, right? Oh, so awesome zero G for parabolic zero G flights. That's step one, totally. and you can do that today. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, but you can do that today. Mm -hmm. Step two. Suborbital flights, Virgin mm -hmm. Galactic, x uh, that other thing that we talked about last week that I can't remember its name. <laughs> that one. That other rocket plane. Yep. Those are great step two. You can go to Ferilzi space or what's considered the boundary of space mm -hmm. and you can experience not just weightlessness, but you can see the curvature of the Earth and you yeah. can look back on this little, little beautiful planet of ours and see it without any borders. Right. See it without, just as nature intended. Mm -hmm. Well. They didn't intend us for us to go into space, but you know, just purely as a as a single planet. Yes, a single unit. Single unit. What was that? Step three. Yes. The next step, though, I I think would be spending some time there, mm -hmm. going to maybe a space station or possibly the moon. And the reason I say the moon as opposed to Mars is going to Mars. You're committing a large chunk of your life. You're committing at least two years of your life. Right. Most likely three to five minimum. Right. Minimum, if you want to go there. You're, it's going to be expensive, and it's going to be hard. Right. Going to the moon will also be expensive to start with, but a couple of points. You've brought this up in the past. I think this is a super valid point. You can look at the moon mm -hmm. from pretty much anywhere on the planet. You can look up and you can go, there are humans there. Right. Much harder to do with Mars. Mars is just a little point of light in the sky, and most people can't identify Mars. Right. You can identify the moon, though. You can look and you can go, there are humans up there. Mm -hmm. The second thing is if you're experiencing it, it's just a few days to get to the moon, a few days to come back, and you could spend a week there. So you could take a two-week vacation 
That's a much smaller time commit. You could right. potentially take a two-week vacation on the moon. Now, obviously, you can't do any of this today. Right. But we're working towards Mars. Who's working towards the moon? More so than just rovers. Who's working towards putting humans on the moon? And then part two, does it matter? Maybe we shouldn't be focusing on the moon. We've been there. We've done that. Maybe we should focus on Mars. Interesting. Interesting. Well, so one of the things when we sort of discussed this earlier was I was saying, you know, who wants to go on a trip for that long? You know, I, I don't know if I want to travel for three days to get to my destination. And that's kind of why you said, well, we'll make it a two week, make it a two week thing. Because, yeah, you don't want to travel for three days, be there for one day and then travel again for three yeah, days. It's got to be like home. a two week trip. right? That's yeah, nobody in their right mind but, is going to do that. But my parent, my parents do that. I, I don't know how they do this, but th they do that. They'll, they'll trek across country in a car and they right. purposely want the car because they want that experience of right. going out and driving. And remember, that would be a three-day experience. You're, this will probably be the first time you're wait weightless or at the very least weightless for that long and the earth will be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's not like it, it'll be a little cramped, but <laughs> I mean, that will be kind of cool. You'll be able to experience that. You can radio back home and talk about stuff. It'll be kind of a cool journey. Uh, yeah, I yeah okay. So so there's that, and like you said, I mean when the same thing of you know looking up at the moon and saying there's people on there. Mm -hmm. You know I mm -hmm. I know that I think it would the reverse is also true, right? You were saying that Mars would just be a dot in yeah. the sky, mm -hmm. and it, th we've seen pictures of Earth from Mars, and it's the same kind of thing. It's a dot. Right? It's kind of cool, but it's still just a dot. In right, the sky. but when you're on the moon, you can look back at Earth. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother sort of sensation. Well, it depends on where you're at on the moon. But yes. Right, right, right. But Let's assume the, that that's true. Yes. There's the option, too, I suppose, is where I'm getting at. Um, where you can you can be on the moon mm -hmm. and look back at Earth and say, everyone that I've ever known ever, 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 other than the people I'm with, are <laughs> are, are right there. And mm -hmm. that, that's a really, really cool thing. And so I don't know. I mean, that's, that's interesting. But at the same time, like, maybe you, uh, what's wrong with an asteroid? Asteroids are harder because they're not necessarily just stationary, right? They could be swirling and swiveling and doing weird things. Right. Uh, mining asteroids kind of makes sense to me, but habitating one, using it as a place to get away, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I buy that one yet. Okay. I, I mean, why would I would probably I would argue for a space station like a Bigelow inflatable hab, right. something that's low Earth orbit, easy to get to, single day up, single day back, assuming a quick approach. Right. Uh, the moon is a logical next step for that. Right. And then the step after that, I feel like, is Mars. But that's purely that's not from a pushing humanity forward. That's from a getting everyone excited about science stand. Well, I suppose, yeah, right? So uh, for those of you who watch the show, and particularly post-show, you know that Ben and I are big, great big Disney nerds. Uh, we have we live right near Disneyland. We were married at Disney World. Um, you know, Disney in the same country, mm -hmm. but it's completely separate coasts, and one is much larger than the other, et cetera, et cetera. And people keep asking us, what what are the differences? The main differences between the two, and ultimately, our answer comes down to they are for different types of purposes. They're for different purposes. So maybe that's what Moon and Mars are. They're different destinations for, with different purposes does that make sense sure but we're targeting I, I yes and i do want actually i've been kind of glossing over this i think rick mann said something that was brilliant which is people used to take trains trips for days and ocean liner trips for weeks so this it's not unheard of to go someplace and I didn't spend say it was great. unheard of but no no, no i think of you know instant information right all right true true i mean our attention right. spans are not what they used to be so the, the it, it's it's the argument of moon versus mars i guess which is if you can use the moon as a way to get people excited about Mars, mm -hmm. that might help money start to flow for Mars, which could then make Mars travel more rapid. So what would what could happen, I'm not saying what would happen, but mm -hmm. one potential outcome is you set up your habitat on the moon, which should be easier to get to and easier to maintain than mm -hmm. Mars. Mm -hmm. Questionable on that, right? Yeah, it's all relative, for it, sure. Because... That may not be a true statement. That that data point may be wrong. I openly admit that. But let's let's assume let's assume for a moment that it's not. That sure. it is that is, um, tw it's twice as hard to get to Mars than it is to the Moon right. and, and set up a permanent habitat. 
right? So twice as hard to do Mars. If you do the moon first, you can use that as a way to get other people excited about this stuff, about mm -hmm. people getting excited about space, and use that to then fund your Martian trips. So right. it would take you maybe 10 years to get to the moon mm -hmm. and then 10 years to get to Mars. At the but, same time, though, you don't want to just pin all of your hopes and dreams on the moon in order to get to Mars. If your destination really is Mars, why are you settling for the moon? Okay, so... Good point. Good point. So then you've got, then you would have, why not have both running concurrently? Right. Right. Have someone doing the moon and have someone doing Mars. Right. SpaceX is doing Mars. I have very little doubt in my mind that SpaceX will go to Mars. It, it's pretty clear. And not, SpaceX will put humans on Mars. Yeah. And it's just a question of will they be first or not? Right. I think they will actually be first at this point. Yeah. I, I don't see anyone else nearly as far along as they are, but sure. I'm biased. So, um, so SpaceX is going to Mars. Other entities like SLS and NASA have said we want to go to Mars. Right. Who's putting humans on the moon? China. Okay. Right. All right. So China. And Golden Spike. But have no uh, Golden Spike isn't putting them on the moon. I think they're going around the moon. Aren't no, no. Golden Spike isn't doing any of that. Golden Spike's going to asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're thinking of. Uh... Planetary resources. Both planetary and Golden Spike are, are doing the same thing. All right. Yeah, they're both asteroid mining. Okay. Yeah. I. Well, I, I guess where's the Mars one for the moon? Where's Moon say, one? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I China though, right? Like, aren't they? I don't yeah, know. yeah. You know, you're right. So China has said that they want to go to, but are they going to stay on the moon? Well, I have no, no why idea. Would they? Know, why would they? Yeah. Why on earth would they? Wait, so are they just going to flags and footprints again? At which point, yeah, that's kind of exciting for... It's the same problem as Apollo. It's exciting for a while, and then it's not exciting anymore. Right. What's truly exciting, what gets people inspired, is when they can participate, and it, and it impacts them. So not only do you need a colony or base on the moon... Mm -hmm. Oh, look at you. Yeah. I'm totally wrong. Colin Spike is going to the moon. That's what I said. Anyhow. All right. So, but how real is that? So SpaceX, well, I don't know. Is, so SpaceX is very real. How real is Golden Spike? Maybe very real, and I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, we why did I think that they were going? All right, chat room. Why did I think they were doing asteroids? Why am I crazy? No. Uh, anyhow. Sorry, not to derail that, but uh, yeah. Deep Space Industries. Oh, deep that's, space that's industries. why I screwed up. I messed them up with Deep Space Industries. Copy that. that the wrong synapse fired up Thank there. you. I am entire. I am very sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, I was wrong. Thank you, Haldusk. So yes, all right. Uh, so all right. So maybe we do have enough organizations going to the moon, but are they going to be able to do it? Mm -hmm. And is it something that they should be doing? So this is where we turn to you, the Space Vidcast community, and ask you to keep the conversation going. Go to YouTube.com/spacevidcast. Go to spacevidcast.com. Go to Patreon.com/spacevidcast and comment on this episode. We'd love to hear what you think. Are we forgetting about the moon? Are we not doing anything with the moon? Is the moon important at this stage or should we just skip the moon and go straight to Mars? And the companies that are focusing on the moon, uh, Golden Spike, you mentioned, was one. Uh, China is another. You're right. Uh, they're not a company, but you get the idea. Are the entities focusing on the there moon, are they going to be able to go to the moon, set up a colony, kind of do all the things that we're talking about going to Mars? Mm -hmm. And is this important? Is, is the moon important in the grand scheme of humanity? Or should we just skip it and go straight to Mars? Mm -hmm. Or Titan or wherever, right? Because I feel... I feel Enceladus. <laughs> Someone once said, uh, I'd love to go to the surface of Saturn. And I'm like, uh, that's not a thing. That's All like right. getting married that's, on the sun. That's You can't... Mm, Only at so nighttime, though. Because it's darker. All right. So... Uh, <laughs> it's cooler. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah. What do you think? Leave your comments <laughs> on the show. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And speaking of comments, when we come back... Comments from last week's show where we talked about uh, uh, the lunar rights, like who could own the moon. So when you go to the moon or when you go to the Mars, uh, can you own that land? Can you put a picket fence down? Can you put – that would be kind of – I want that picture. I do. On the moon, earth in the background, a picket fence, and an astronaut standing outside like pounding it into the – Oh, uh, I want an astrodog. An astrodog. How would that – how would that work? <laughs> we'll be right back. Do you put it in like a spacesuit? Or does it go in a – a bar a bark? Yeah. One, zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles were doing amazing things in space. 
we've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back. We'd like to thank the Space Vidcast patrons who made this. <laughs> the font's getting smaller. <laughs> we need to do something about that. Well, no, here's what happened. Here's what changed between last week and this week. Yes. Is um, if you're a Space Vidcast patron. So uh, let me let me clarify this. Leave this slide up for a moment so you just can actually second. read it for Almost. just a second. You can find your name uh, in it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if... Uh, if you're a Space Vidcast patron, that's anyone who spent anywhere from one dollar on, essentially. So anyone who spent more than a dollar on this episode, on this exact episode, you are a Space Vidcast patron. And again, thank you very much. Every dollar helps uh, make this go. And the neat thing about Patreon is you can set limits, right? So you go, oh, well, I, I know that it, they do multiple episodes per month, so do I want to give them... You know, what, what happens if they do 10 episodes? I don't want to give them, you know, five bucks per episode and then have them... Yeah, you know. here's the deal. The really nice thing about the cap on it is that it's helping us stay consistent, but it's also helping us not screw you over, okay? Right. So you only have $4 extra a month, so we typically do about four shows a month, and you can say $1 per show, but no more than $4. And that maintains, that helps us per show, but it also makes sure that we don't just put out something random and silly and Ben putting his shoes on and calling it a show and then charging you for it. That would be an epic show that people would pay for, though. Well, yeah, because you've never seen it, and it really, it's a whole entire production. But, that, no, but, the, but the point... Now people do want to see it. Now they do want to see we'll, it. We'll put it out, but we won't call it a show. The point here is that um, it's, it's helping you uh, maintain your budget, but it's also letting you help us yeah, if you get value from the show, please consider giving value back. The best way to do that is via uh, monetary, right? So we can do cool new things. Uh, and you can see there are goals. Not only there are not only are there levels for you to subscribe at, there are different mm -hmm. goals for us to reach. And we are so close to our next goal of four hundred dollars per episode. And at four hundred dollars per episode, we can get it some additional gear uh, that's going to get rid of this microphone. It's going to give us some lapel microphones, mm -hmm. so you're going some better audio. Uh, moves us to a new audio board as well. It's going to uh, get us a. Um, Presonus, the small Presonus mixer, and that's important because it does limiting and compression on the board. So the new microphones plus the Presonus mixer should give you much better audio f overall for the show. Also, new cameras, so we'll have a few more views for you of the studio and one of the control room where you can talk to Dada. Uh, and that's just the next goal. That's just four hundred dollars. As we grow and as we get bigger, we can do bigger and cooler things. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Patreon and look at some of the other pro uh, programs, you can actually see. You know, some of the technology shows, they're like 2000 per show, 5000 per show, 7000 per show. And technology is cool and it helps everyone. But there are 9 million technology shows out there. There are not very many space shows out there. I would love to see Space Vidcast competing at the same level as those technology shows. Yeah. Because A, I'm competitive. But B, I think space, human space flight, the settlement of other planets, and talking about this stuff and getting people excited about this stuff is more important than technology because you can get technology from what we learn from this stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the technology that's going into R2 is actually being used here on Earth for exoskeletons for people with disabilities. Cool. That's really cool. Cool. That's really awesome Perfect stuff. Perfect example. Cool. I, and I, I love the 66 cents, you guys. Right now we have 108 patrons. It's 331.66 per show. And I love the 66 cents. I think it's hilarious. So please consider helping us on Patreon. A uh, couple of final notes on Patreon. Uh, one, we listened to your comments. And we were doing this spiel at the beginning of the show. A mm -hmm. lot of people were like, Ugh, just shut up and get to the news. So we do that now. We also changed it. And we, made, we used to do... Um, all the patrons all at once, and now we split it up in between the three different sections. Mm -hmm. And what changed this week, if you didn't notice, is that if you are a Space Vidcast premiere member, your sh name was in the show three times. Mm -hmm. You were on the premiere slide, mm -hmm. you are on the producer slide, mm -hmm. and you are on the Patreon slide. Mm -hmm. and uh, or, I'm sorry, patron slide. And so that's new, which means that there are a lot more people on the patron slide than there were before, which is what made the font so small. <laughs> uh, let me know if you like that. It's kind of an extra perk. You know, you give us more money, your, show, your name shows up in the show more times. I think that's kind of cool. And what other perks would you guys like to see? Something where we're not mailing you stuff, because that gets weird, because do I mail you something every time we do a show? Do right. I mail you once a month? How do I how do I make that go? It doesn't work the same way, but something that you would get value from. We're going to be doing some Google Hangouts with you guys for, at certain levels, so that's an obvious one. But what else would you guys like to see that makes it valuable for you, so that 
we can add more value to you so that you can go, yeah, I can justify, you know, five bucks a show or a dollar a show or ten dollars a show, whatever it may be. All right, let's go ahead and get into those comments from last week's show. This first one comes from CocoFan50, which says, why can't we make an international governing space body, draw a line where space starts, and then give it control over space? Well, you know, there's no technical reason why we can't do that. I think mm -hmm. it's all political, right? Mm -hmm. You know, at this stage, it's... it's how are you going to get the governments of the entire world to agree on a universal space body right? and then give them power over a certain altitude? Versus themselves. Versus themselves, right? right? They probably want to control it themselves. Right. So we could technically do that. I just think politically it would be very difficult to do. I don't work in that arena, so you know who knows? Maybe, maybe not. I suppose. This one comes from Javier Norris, Oops. who says, I think I said that right, Javier Norris. Yes. That's Javier underscore Norris, who says, Interesting to consider ownership of celestial bodies as possible incentives for space entrepreneurs. Given this considerable capital expenditure, it might make sense to allow some, quote, participant expiration date ownership to balance out the risk reward. So in other words, uh, you, get, you get it for X amount of time. Right. Um, but ne not necessarily forever, right? Uh, just because you are a participant. Ooh, ooh, because like you like you're renting it. Kind of, yeah. Like a timeshare. Like a moon lunar timeshare, yeah. I'm in. The, we, <laughs> Done. Welcome to the Space Vidcast Lunar Timeshare Program. Yes. You're, we're, we'll take a cue from ULA and your satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. <laughs> see what I did there? Yeah, I see, see what, what I did, did there? Okay. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Patreon.com right. slash... I'm just <laughs> uh, Bill, Bill Hughesley, who is a, uh, a regular viewer and avid commenter. Mm -hmm. So first off, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Um, says, just spread out a big tarp around your structure. The tarp, the tarp itself is a tri type of structure. The tarp is yours. So that gives you your land to do your work on. Ooh. That brings up an interesting thing, which is, generally speaking, property rights are you know just kind of that amount of land. But we don't, and I know that there is like you own this much above it and be below it. Right. But with the advent of us colonizing space, I think we're going to have to really think more in three dimensional space about okay, totally. how much do I really own above and below this? Right. 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 I mean, that's going to become a much bigger deal. Yeah. Well, we had we've talked about airspace and the, that whole idea of like no mm -hmm. fly zones and, sure. and what have you. Um, but yeah, once you start getting into uh, mining and all that, you know, the reason that you don't own everything all the way down to the Earth's core for where you uh, where your house is is because there's there's plumbing and electrical and all kinds of other stuff that goes on underneath there that you shouldn't be touching anyway. You know, sure. people live above subways and, and whatnot, and the government kind of takes care of that, and that, that brings up all of those interesting ideas. Uh, but I, I, I like the tarp idea. It's an interesting little loophole. Said, well, this is mine, and therefore this is mine, and so uh, that's mine. I'll Sorry. Be, I'll just put a, a green... Like AstroTurf now? AstroTurf? <laughs> Ooh, it brings AstroTurf. It has a whole new oh, meaning new now. Oh, new meaning to AstroTurf. Yes! Oh, man. I love it. There's there's, there's, <laughs> there's a meme there somewhere. There is. Moopers 2. <laughs> I'd like to know who Moopers 1 and Moopers are. I but think Moop it's Moppers. Moopers. No, Moppers. There's not two O's in that one. I don't. It's way more fun to say Moopers. Well, though. sure. It's until Moppers changes their name. All right, go fine. on. Moppers too. <laughs> not as much fun. All right. I don't care who Moppers and Moppers oh, one are. Sad. Why not have an After Dark channel? Since I have only made one show and I've been watching for a while, I feel like I'm missing out on some stuff. For those of you who remember Space Vidcast Epic, uh, one of the rewards for Epic was an After Dark show. So yes. when we're done doing this show, we're, we stay on the air for a while and we continue to talk to you guys, maybe about space, maybe about Disney, maybe about Disney, uh, most likely about Disney, Usually and with a little bit of space. Hungry and tired we are. Uh, oh yeah, hungry and tired, <laughs> just random stuff. And that's why we don't post to the Space Feedcast channel because it's not really good enough for that, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's fun and people like to feel like they're part of the community and we like to feel like you're all included. Absolutely. So that's where I say uh, I understand, but um, no. <laughs> it's a lot of extra work. More importantly, I think at this point, it's incentive to join us live. And I realize for some people around the world, because we are worldwide shows, one of the cool things about the internet, mm -hmm. that can be very difficult to do. But everyone who's joining us live right now, and there are a ton of people in the chat room, um, 
that's one of the rewards that they get. It doesn't cost them anything, but they get to continue to talk to us after the show. And we'll just have a very candid conversation about anything at all. Along those same exact lines, I feel like, um, just a random thought in my brain, uh -oh. I feel like we don't have enough interaction with a chat room. And what I'd like to do, excuse me, what we're doing today is we're trying the live stream chat room mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. And it's, it's okay. I'm not sure if we'll keep it. Uh, but I also want to get some Twitter integration on the screen. Mm -hmm. So as you're as you're watching the show, you can tweet with like a hashtag TMRO mm -hmm. hashtag, and we'll we'll pick those up, and we'll have someone moderating those, and we can then put those up on screen, and that would be kind of like the big way we'll communicate with you guys and kind of really bring the live element back into the show. We used to have that live chat room on the bottom. Mm -hmm. We got too big for that. Mm -hmm. I kind of like to bring it back, but I'm, I'm a little scared to do the live chat room itself. Twitter, I think, would be a great way. And the other nice thing about Twitter is when you're tweeting about the show, it can get other people who maybe weren't, you didn't know about the show or right. forgot about it, it can get them going, well, what are you talking about? And you can start side conversations. For sure. So that's something I want to do. And that is a Patreon goal. So if you go Yay. over to patreon.com slash spacefoodcast, and everyone's like, stop talking about Patreon. It makes us go. It does. Glander Brondurk. Uh-huh. Can I say that right? Sure. All right. I'm curious about the consequences of simply re uh, repealing or opting out of the Outer Space Treaty. The current treaty permits countries to withdraw with a one-year notification period to all of the current signing countries. Well, that's the same. Yeah, the same. That, that's what happens in the Outer Space Treaty. You can you can sign. You got a one-year deal. You can right. get out of it if you want to. Um, it's that would be inter It would be an interesting political landscape. Right. Remember, we've already we being the United States have already told China no. Well, you can't be part of the International Space Station. Right. In fact, you can't be a part of any of our space stuff. And so China said. Fine, we'll build our own, and yeah. and they did. And they did. And I so now China's looking going back to the moon. Now China can send Taikonauts to space where the U.S. cannot. Right. China's making some pretty good inroads because we told them no. Imagine what happens when we say, mm, "Screw the Outer Space Treaty." <laughs> what's China? What's China going to do then? Are they going to be like, "All right, we're free to do whatever we want now"? Who knows what will happen? What are the ramifications of that? So maybe you could, but you really need to think about it at a much higher level than I even mentioned. I, I don't even right. know. I mean, that's not an area that I'm well educated in, so right. I can't. Those are just off the top of my head. There's probably a lot more. <laughs> Unintended consequences. Exactly. Boop, boop. <laughs> Michael Five says... Michael Five, <laughs> you're a nerd. <laughs> I was I was hoping I could just gloss over nope, that. You wouldn't nope, have noticed nope, that, nope. and then other people would be like, ah, kind of like the nope. Lego man that doesn't exist. Right. Uh, the sooner, I mean, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Oh, I have no idea what you're talking about too. The sooner new and cheaper human space flight arrives, the better. But to put a price, uh, you just moved your. Oh, put sorry. the price of the Soyuz seats into perspective. The cost of a seat on Dragon Rider proposed. So this mm -hmm. is the SpaceX cost is mm -hmm. twenty million per seat. The cost of a Soyuz right now is seventy million per seat, and the cost of the space shuttle is two hundred eight million dollars per seat. So that gives you an idea as to how much things cost. That right. is not a fair comparison, Michael Five. And the reason I say that is because the space shuttle cost that two hundred eight million. I assume you got that by multiplying that or divide. Yeah, basically taking the total cost of the space shuttle and dividing by seven and giving the per seat cost. And sure, that would be how much it would cost if you were only sending astronauts up. But remember, with right. the space shuttle, you're also sending an entire payload up with it. Mm -hmm. So you got to have to take that into account as well. It's weird because you have to send the astronauts, whereas on a rocket, you don't have to send the astronauts. Right. Or... You know, on you also kind of have to send the payload. I suppose you don't have to send a payload, but why would you go up without a payload? Yeah. So it's not you're not comparing apples to apples there, right? And I'm not sure that that's really fair to the space shuttle, right? I'm not sure it would be as low as 70 million per seat, but I'm also pretty sure, and I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that one seat of Soyuz that we pay pays for the whole mission for Russia. So there's that too. You know, I mean, just yeah, that's what they're charging. That doesn't mean that's what it costs. Yeah, exactly. And, and those are two different things. All right. Uh, last comment, and that's from Taiwan John eighty eight. This is a long one. Um, 
I watched the Senate hearing on the expendable, evolved expendable launch vehicles with Elon, and I found it to be fairly typical. Elon made some good points, and the entrenched establishment side-trotted out their usual arguments. Yawn. In the end, it hardly matters. SpaceX launch manifest is going to be packed to the gills anyway, with or without military cargoes. And once they get their rockets even partially reusable, SpaceX will quickly crush the competition, hopefully including the money pit known as the Space Launch System. So, uh, kind of, let's be fair to the SLS. Um, as far as I know right now, they are on time and on budget. Right. That doesn't mean that it's not sucking a lot of money because it is extremely expensive. Even on budgets, extremely expensive. Yeah. But it is actually kind of moving forward along the lines they said it would, and they are building a super heavy lift rocket. Mm -hmm. There is always the chance that the commercial companies will fail. Right. There's no guarantee in anything in life. And there's no guarantee that anyone else will build a super heavy lift rocket. Mm -hmm. So just because someone else is promising that their paper rocket will be cheaper than your paper rocket, let's get let's move forward with both paper rockets question mark. I mean there are arguments on both sides of that, right? So it's so expensive to build SLS. It's right. so expensive to fly SLS. Maybe it's not worth that paper rocket because NASA can't really afford to fly it. Right. So we build it and then we can't fly it. I don't know what the real answer is. Yeah. But, but right now, I'm, I'm kind of... Any competition is good competition. Yes. So I'm hoping that... It won't just be this paper rocket and this paper rocket. I'm hoping it will be this real rocket, this real rocket, right. and this real rocket, and this real rocket. And let's see what we can do with these really cool, really awesome rockets that humanity has never seen before. Yeah. That's the exciting thing about all of that. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, we will have a show next week, I believe. However, uh, SpaceX has pushed their launch back to the end of March. The that's right on a weekend, so we will likely be missing that particular show. We'll right. keep you guys up to date. Make sure to follow Space Vidcast at twitter.com slash space vidcast, or uh, if you follow our live stream channel, livestream.com slash space vidcast, and follow us, mm -hmm. uh, you'll get notifications as to when the live shows are going to be and when they're live. So if you are like, oh, I forgot, you can just use that. You can add it to the calendar. It's a really awesome service from live stream. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. For those of you watching live, stay with us. After Dark is up next, and we'll see you guys next week.